So glad you you guys decided to come back again for another another service. We've been preaching the same sermon the whole year, the scribes before the scrolls, but it's part twenty. And um, this morning we're going to talk about Zechariah. I'm not sure if some of you read the book a little bit in the week or a little bit earlier, but it's probably another one of those strange books. Zechariah, he, he comes to a point where he sees all these weird visions and people struggle to interpret this vision. It's just strange. And, and outside people look at the Bible and say, look how weird the Bible is. Well, I want to ask you, have you never had weird dreams ever in your life? You know, so we, we're so overly critical, but you need to understand when Zechariah is dreaming these things, our dreams get a little bit weird and strange, you know. And then through the dream, Zechariah writes and he says, God is showing him something and he, he tries to explain what's happening. And I'm excited to jump into some of these passages today. I'm going to ask you, okay, you guys can just follow off on the, the pulpit uh, of the screen. If this microphone gives off a lot of bass, you all guys are welcome just to switch it out especially when i start shouting um but it's 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 out of love um we're going to talk from zechariah chapter 8 verse 1 and it says the following and the law and the word of the lord of hosts came saying thus is the lord of hosts i am jealous for zion zion with great jealousy and i am jealous for her with great i love that word no but you must do it in a okay Verse 3, thus says the Lord, I have returned to Zion and I will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem and Jerusalem shall be called the faithful city and the mountain of the Lord of hosts, um, the holy mountain. Verse 4, thus says the Lord of hosts, old men and old women, can I go arm and cry? Okay, fantastic. Old men and old women shall again sit in the streets of Jerusalem, each with staff in their hand because of great age. I just want to pause there. What a blessing. What a blessing it is to get so old you are struggling to walk, to, to get so old you have to use a cane, you know. And, and this is exactly what Zechariah, I'm going to talk about that in a second. What a privilege to get old, you know. And I, I, I do understand that, that with, with age comes your, your, your body's deteriorating and things aren't working anymore. And, you know, life does happen. But what a blessing to be able to, to live through life and pursue dreams and goals and come to a point where you have seen it. And you have heard it and, and you have a legacy that you can expand on. It's, it's such a beautiful part. But it's not only just for old people. One verse 5 says, And the streets of the city shall be full of boys and girls playing in its streets. Thus is the Lord of hosts, if it is marvelous in the sight of the remnant of his people in those days, should it also be marvelous in my sight, declares the Lord of hosts. Verse 7. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will save my people from the east country and from the west country, and I will bring them to dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. And listen to this beautiful verse. And they shall be my people, and I will be their God. I mean, just that phrase gets repeated so many times in the Old Testament, okay? Um, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God in faithfulness and in righteousness. Yes. Thank you, JJ. So, you can go to the next slide for me. Thank you. Oh, this is going to be worse. Okay, don't worry. Okay, <laughs> we'll go through it. Okay, we're going to talk a little bit about Zechariah, and I need you to understand we're building off of our previous service. So don't worry, I'm not going to do a recap because I need a little bit more time to run through Zechariah because it's a little bit of a longer and a little bit more deeper book. Um, but if you missed last week's sermon, just go check it out. It's online available, and it builds into Zechariah. Now, you need to understand that Zechariah took over from the previous prophet. So it's not distances apart. It's not crazy amount of time. It's one prophet flowing to another prophet and you guys if you've been here for a while you know it's the return of Jerusalem uh, it's the return of the Israelites they're restoring their nation they're trying to build the temple they're trying to fix the wall and it's in that whole process I'm not going to expand on that too much but um, if you f find yourself a little bit lost you need to watch the previous um, sermons now let's jump into Zechariah and that part that we were reading about says the following and thus is the Lord of hosts old men and old women shall again sit in the streets of Jerusalem and the reason why Zechariah is prophesying this is because of the devastation of the war because of what happened in Babylon and you guys know we've talked about Daniel and all those type of um, conversation I'm not going to rewind back to that when you go to your city 
and you don't see people getting of old age anymore. That's a concerning sign. It's a sign of heartache. It's a sign of defeat. It's a sign of death because loved ones are missing. They are not there to be the old people with a cane walking into church, sitting at the street corners, um, having a cup of tea. They are missing in your life. It's a, it's a sign of devastation. And Zechariah says he, he sees something. He sees a time of restoration that's about to, um, to come up in the nation because we will have old people for a change. And sometimes younger people don't appreciate older people. Not sometimes, I I almost want to say often. Often, us younger guys think we are smarter than the older people. We, We are busy with our lives, but we neglect to appreciate those who has gone before us. We ne- neglect to show honor to those who's gone before us. And I know it's extremely difficult because some of us feel that there's little things to honor in some of the seniors that we look up to, you know. And, and this is where my, my grandfather has been phenomenal. And I've shared, shared this with you before. I just want to say this one more. He always said that he, he, this was probably the most significant sentence he ever said in my life, to me in my life. He said he always aims to live a life that's worthy of the honor of his kids and his grandkids. And that's the seniors that I was exposed to. And in that concept, that's where honor is due. That's where respect is due because those were the people who had gone before you. And what a blessing it is. I can, I can recall what, what, a, what a phenomenal privilege, privilege it is. And I had the um, honor of even knowing my great-grandfather, okay? Some people, <laughs> I'm getting one white hair on my beard, okay? It's just one, okay? And everyone is irritated because they just want to take it out. And I said, no, this is part of my legacy. My great-grandfather... In, in, in Priska, okay, you know, that was an old woman with a long white beard, ladies and gentlemen. It was very thinned out, but he had a long white beard. I'm getting there, okay? I'm getting there. Gandalf and my great-grandfather is my idol. And so the idea and the concept is what a privilege it is to, be, to, to know the legacy and where your family line comes from. And I understand that's not true for everyone, but I want you to understand what Zechariah is trying to bring across. The positive sense where the place was destroyed, but restoration is taking place. And people will get old again for a change. But he doesn't leave it there. He goes from verse, um, verse 5 and he says, And the streets of the city shall be full of boys and girls playing in the street. And again, I'm thinking when I was a little bit younger, 90s, 90s. Okay, I'm not really a 90s child, but, you know, I'm so close to the 90s. Let's call me a 90s child. And, you know, playing in the streets, running up and down, spilling mid clappers. You know, just doing a lot of nonsense stuff. You know, I may or may not have accidentally... Um, driven into a few cars that's parked on the street corners, you know, just because I'm trying to learn how to drive a bicycle. And I want you to get this picture of being outside and the street lights goes on and you have a lot of kids causing nonsense in the street. They're making noise. They're playing cricket with the dustbins in the streets and the balls of the, the ball are falling into your yard and they're jumping over. And, and you know, that's a sign. It's a sign of life. It's a sign of joy. It's a sign of health. And that's why people today are complaining and say, like, kids aren't doing that anymore, you know. But it's a sign of beautiful restoration. And Zechariah is writing about this, you know. The kids are out there playing talk talky again for a change. Zechariah comes and he kind of expands a little bit on this, you know. But you need to understand that this is the vision, this is the dream, this is the heartbeat. But there are elements connected to this. This is not just going to happen on its own. It's not just auto, it, it's not going to go on autopilot and this is what's going to happen. There's processes involved to, to come to this point of restoration. And the next verse says the following, verse 8, and it says, And I will bring them to dwell in the midst of Jerusalem, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God. And I want you to pick up on this terminology. Remember, the nation of Israel has been rebellious towards God consistently, and their life was in chaos. And now God says, I'm still willing to stay faithful to my part of this agreement. But I need you guys to do your part, okay? I don't want to just be your God. I want you to be my people as well. And sometimes we live in a time where we want, we want God to be our God, but we don't live our lives in a manner where we want to be his people. And so it becomes a little bit contradicting. And in that topic, we're going to spend a little bit of time today. Because just in the next part of this verse, the, the, the prophetic word comes out and it says the following. 
And in other words, I will be their God. And I'm going to put there in, I'm going to translate the Bible in my way to kind of explain this. But it's going to be in faithfulness and in righteousness. Okay. Go to the next one for me, please, Tammy. Thank you. So we're going to talk about these two concepts. Now, I want to expand a little bit on this so you can understand the depth of what the prophet is saying here. So faithfulness and righteousness, I want to use different wording here for you today. I want to use salvation and discipline, okay? So faithfulness is the sense of God is going to be faithful to us, and there's a form for us to be saved. There's a form for us to restore. But righteousness means discipline. Because if God does what is right, it means some of us needs to be disciplined. Okay, all of us needs to be disciplined. So now it becomes very difficult because now I'm going to show you another description to kind of expand on this thought. So we love talking about unconditional love in the church, right? It says God has got unconditional love for us. I use the word and, but I kind of want to use the word but. But it's conditional reciprocity, okay? Don't worry, I had no idea what that word meant. Okay, no, okay. So I, I had to Google this word just so it makes sense, a little bit of sense. So uh, reciprocity means the practice of exchanging things with others for mutual benefit. And right there, people get offended. I can just feel the judgment as you guys are looking at me. How can we say mutual benefit when it comes to God? Well, it's because we only can cling to the one side of God. We don't talk about the other side. We, we love talking about the grace, but we don't talk about the discipline. We love talking about the forgiveness, but we don't like to talk about the rules. And so I'm going to do my best today to kind of balance these two ideas of, of you. And I hope this is going to expand um, your, your understanding. So um, can you go just to the previous one for me, if you don't mind? Thank you. So you need to understand that unconditional love, there's appreciation, there's value, there's love. But God does a, expect a response from us. Now, it doesn't change the way he feels about us. But there's something about mutual reciprocity that you need to understand where it needs to be mutual beneficial. You guys know this in your relationship. But when it comes to God, we skip that part. Okay, so let me explain this to you. You understand the value of doing something for your spouse. And you understand the value that they need to do something for you. It's not ugly. It's not a contract. It is a relationship. It is a mutual gathering together and working together to make things work. That's just the reality of of relationships so there can be unconditional love but there is this element of expectation of a relationship my problem with this terminology is that we stop by unconditional love when it comes to god can i be completely blunt you don't even love your own spouse with that type of love we have two people watching all the way from New Zealand today, okay? And they've been married, and um, Jakob was just, we just want to give a shout out to Rian and Karen, and we just want to mention that they, they, are, they are married, and they, they got baptized together, and they're buying spiritual books together, and they are so excited about their journey and following God, and they, it's, 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 it's actually a beautiful story on how things are developing in their life, and we are so proud of them. But I want you to understand something is that they are doing something together. They are, they are building together. They are changing together. They are growing together. And so there is an element of unconditional love, but this is also this idea of sometimes I'm not strong enough. I need my partner to be strong enough, or sometimes I'm not wise enough. I need my partner to be wise enough. And you, and you work together to build something out moving forward, but you need to do it together together okay it's exactly the same with our relationship with God yes you can have unconditional love and at the same time expect a mutual relationship to take place it works in life this way and it works with God this way and I know you guys uh, this doesn't sound like church well this is the real story of the Bible I'm going to explain everything to you in a second now I'm going to go to a vision that Zechariah saw, 
And I want to link this conversation of unconditional love with this expected relationship conversation. We're going to look at this vision that Zechariah saw. And then I'm going to talk to you about my dad's favorite topic, the three rebellions. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to take all of them together. We're going to stick them together. And I hope at the end of the sermon, you're going to have a better idea on what I mean about this idea that God really does love us, but there's an expectation of us to respond towards that love. So it can, it, it can make a little bit more more sense okay you can go to the, the first verse immediately now listen to this vision which is actually phenomenal any case then he showed me joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the lord now this is zechariah seeing if you guys um, vis, um attended the previous sermons you know joshua should be familiar he's the high priest in the ter- in the time when the the nation of israel is being restored after the babylonian exile any case standing before the lord and satan standing at his right hand to accuse him now this is phenomenal in this vision that zechariah saw he saw someone standing before god that god loved and yet he saw Satan right next to him, which God kind of not love. Okay, I can't use other words. I'm just going to say not love. Okay, or well, whatever the terminology you want to use. I'm, we're going to talk about him in a second, okay? Now you need to understand that these two are standing next to each other. And Satan is accusing Joshua of something. And here's the most difficult part for God. Satan is not wrong. The accuser in this case is not being deceitful. He's not lying. He's not manipulating anything. He's taking facts and he's standing before God and saying, God, this is the facts about Joshua. This is the guy standing next to me. And it's going to um, kind of expand a little bit. And God comes to a point where he, he, he gets, oh, please excuse me if I use this human terms of God. I'm just trying to express the emotion behind this. Where God almost becomes frustrated because look at the next verse. Remember, it's in a vision in dream. And the Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, O Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? And here's the best part of it all god comes to a point and he says you are right because this guy i just saved him i like just just he just made it like he really like minimum that was the i mean this guy this he's he's almost like other church people in other churches okay they're like minimum like right there right there okay and god says i rebuke satan because now he's bringing someone that just made it and god comes from a perspective to say i'm rejoicing that someone just made it and satan comes and he says i'm accusing someone for just making it and god comes to the point where he rebukes satan in this context okay but now look at what zechariah sees now joshua was standing before the angel clothed with filthy garments now you need to understand how insulting this sentence is in the context of the old testament writing you were not allowed to have dirty clothes when you were working in the temple they were meticulous about what you wore how clean it was how neat things were there were very strict rules and guidelines because when you enter into the temple it was a holy place now holy we've got a different idea of holy holy just means it's designated it's set apart in other words this is the only function of this place now when you enter with dirty clothes it means it hasn't been sanctified it hasn't been set apart for the service of god it says that ah we just do some garden work and then i go worship god in the same clothes it's it's not really physically about the clothes it's about idea of standing in the environment where you dedicate something to god There's, that's the terminology that's taking place over here okay um, i'm going to get to a preaching part in a second i'm just building up this vision that he's seeing okay verse all and the angel said to those who were standing before him remove the filthy garments from him And to him he said, Behold, I have taken your iniquity away from you, and I will clothe you with pure vestments. In other words, even though you come into the house and you are dirty, God is willing to clean you. God is willing to do the work on your behalf to say that this is your current condition but as you enter into my presence i'm about to change that for you and this is the conversation of unconditional love it's that first step of saying i am ready to do my part of the covenant first next verse 
And I said, let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him with garments. And the angel of the Lord was standing by. Satan was ready to accuse, but God had his angel on the other side also ready to restore. And it's always going to be this battle between am I worthy enough, am I holy enough, am I clean enough? And on the other side, you're going to have the angel of the Lord that's going to say, but I'm going to make you clean, I'm going to restore you, I'm going to put you in a position where you will shine. I will put you in a position where you will become clean. And that's usually where we kind of stop with the story, right? Okay, I just want to show you the next verse quickly. And the angel of the Lord solemnly assured Joshua, verse 7. Thus says the Lord of hosts, if you walk in my ways and keep my charge, then. So we understand unconditional love. But if I'm not mistaken, that sounds very conditional to me. You see, so what we do as a modern society is we take one part of the conversation. And we stop reading by the part where God puts us new clothes on and he cleans us. And if you just read a little bit further, you will understand there is conditional reciprocity. In other words, God says, I'm going to clean you. I'm going to put you in a position where you will be functional, but it's your job to stay clean. It's your job now. So I'm going to, put, I'm going to give you the ability to make sure that you go wash your clothes. I'm going to put you in an ability where you can, um, you can respond to this unconditional love that I'm giving you. Okay? Because the problem is there's an accuser and he's not lying about us. Okay? He's not making things up about us. And God understands this, but God gets frustrated because he just saved us. Like, and now we have this idea and this, this responsibility to respond, but we don't. We stop there. We stop, we stop reading the story too early. And then we've got the self-righteousness that we have in our life. And, and I want you to get this whole picture of God's real love for us. But I want you to understand that God's got a desire for something. God wants something. God expects something. And so I'm going to ask you this question today. What does God want? And so I took a buy a book this week, okay, that says, what does God want? Okay, so it's a real book, okay, Michael Laser, it's 60 bucks. I want to encourage you all, if there's one thing that you invest in, leave McDonald's just for one month and go buy that book for 60 bucks on Kindle. It's very cheap. It's very phenomenal. I'm going to blow your mind, okay? This is going to be, uh, you don't have to cheer for this one, okay? So what does God want? He wants you, okay? Yeah, I spent 60 bucks to get that answer out of the book, okay? He, he, he wants you. But the problem is, you know, we, we hear this, but we don't feel this. So I hope this morning, and no, I'm not done. Calm down. I hope this morning that I can get you to feel this statement today. I want you to feel something today from God's perspective about coming to us in a way of cleaning us and then expecting something from us. And I want to I change our hearts when it comes to God's expectation from us. And I want you to understand that it's time for us to respond in a specific manner towards Him. Not because we want Him to love us more, just because we want to show Him that we love Him. That's what a relationship is about. So we're going to just quickly talk about three points, but I want you to understand this concept. And this is going to be true from Genesis all the way through to oh, this guy said, to maps, all the parts in the Bible, okay, all the way through. God, God longs for a healthy family, okay? God just doesn't want a family. He wants a healthy family. And we live in a culture where we give God just a family. You know how we got, give God just a family? Oh, it's my dad. It's my dad but I'm stealing from him, I'm not I'm responding to him, I'm running away from him, I'm doing whatever I want to do. And so we give God a family, but the conversation is a healthy family. And here's the thing, God determines the terms of a healthy family. This is not determined by us. 
This is determined by Him. And this is going to make the best sense when I'm going to talk to you about. I, 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 the reason why I'm laughing is because my mom and my family, they are so tired of this. But I mean, I'm just going to share this with you in any case, okay? The three rebellions, okay? The three rebellions. Now, this, <laughs> okay. now, this is so significant. My dad even preaches at a funeral once, okay? <laughs> so any, I'm just going to jump into this. And I want you to understand the heartbreak that God has been experienced or has been exposed to, if I can use earthly terms, because of us. He desires a family. And I don't think we understand how strong that longing is for a family, okay? And I'm hoping that this will open it up for you just a little bit. So don't miss this. We're talking about Zechariah. We're talking about this desire of restoration for the nation of Jerusalem. Or Israel, sorry. And now he saw, he sees so he sees this vision of Joshua the priest who's dirty, and God gives him something clean. But there's conditions involved in this process, and so I want you to understand why we talk about conditional reciprocity, or at least in our church. Okay. So step number one, I'm going to talk to you quickly about the rebellions because that's going to explain the story. The first rebellion that took place was in the Garden of Eden. Now you guys know the story fantastically well right Adam and Eve they ate some sort of fruit um, you see that's why I don't like fruit I don't eat fruit at all <laughs> I'm sorry I was talking to myself about jokes but I can't say now but it'll... and so we are most familiar with this conversation and so we are Adam and Eve and the Bible talks about this and today we're not even sure if we believe in this but I, I need you to understand the concept okay I'm not going to expand on this point I'm going to expand on Point number two and point number three. But I need you to understand something, that God comes to a point where he desires family. He desires family. And according to Genesis, that was why he created man. That is why he developed us. And he created us in his image. In other words, we have this ability to choose. We have this idea of morality. We have got this, this responsibility to choose God or to not choose Him. And that's the only way you can really have a real relationship is if someone engages with you out of their own. Otherwise, it's just God making a robot and Him telling us to love Him. But here He gives us this option to choose. And, and this is the story of the Garden of Eden, this option to choose. But here's the thing. You know, because it's in Genesis, we think this is the, the this is where things started. But you need to understand, the rebellion had a, a pretext. In other words, there was a conversation before this rebellion, before Genesis. Yes, but let me just carry on with this point. Okay, you guys know the story of the God in Israel. One of God's supernatural children decided to dishonor God's decision to have a human family by tempting Eve, hoping God would destroy her. And Adam, it's out of this book, What Does God Want? I, I really encourage you to read the book. The, the topic is simple, but the, the, the content is, is really amazing. So I want you to understand that. We always think that the first rebellion usually happens with Adam and Eve, but you need to understand there was an instigator behind this. Where did that instigator come from? From God's heavenly family now no weird okay we, we it's gonna get worse okay oh, I, I, I love talking about these weird things about the bible okay okay so adam and eve is there but you need to understand there was someone in god's family that was rebellious okay now the reason why we have this conversation about a heavenly family is because when you read through the bible it, it just pops up the whole time so God has got this heavenly family, but, but for some reason he wants an earthly family. He wants a materialistic family. And the idea of the Garden of Eden is where his families can live together, where his families can be together. And so this is why Adam and Eve in the Bible talks about was engaging with God's heavenly family as well, okay? Now I know this is a little bit strange, but it, just read the Bible, okay? Just read it. it, it it's, it's there. I promise you. I promise you. I promise you, okay? But this is only the one rebellion. Now we say, ah, the world is in this condition because of what Adam and Eve did. No, 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 no. God's heavenly family and his earthly family rebelled against him. And not just once, on multiple occasions. Now, you need to understand this. Why this becomes so significant is because God longs for a family. And every time he steps up, we step away. 
Every time he shows commitment, we move away. Every time he creates elements, his heavenly family rebels against him. And you've got this tension and this heartbreak of a dad that longs for a healthy family, but they are rebellious on the inside of their hearts. They don't respond. Come on, you guys know. You know of a family, maybe it's even you as well. You know of a family that's got a lost son, that's got a lost daughter, and you know that mommy longs for a child. You know that daddy longs to build that relationship, but it's broken, you know? And it can't be fixed because the son is not willing to listen. He's not willing to restore. And, and that, is a, that is heavy. That is hurtful. And now we've got God over and over saying, I will do this covenant if I expect this for you to do. I will do this if you guys can do this for me. Because it's about building a relationship. Now we're going to get to the most strangest part in the entire Bible. Okay? But it's in the Bible. I promise you. I promise you. Just read it. Okay? Listen to what's taking place. The second rebellion is the angel's imitation. Now you, now you need to understand something. Okay? God... The, the, the heavenly family sees God creating man and he's creating man in his image and he's creating himself a family. And now this, oh, my dad talks about the harsh. Okay, but anyway, this isn't, uh, that's, a, that's a Hebrew word. Okay. And he's talking about the spiritual beam, the, the snake. Okay. Um, oh, I don't have time to talk about that now. Okay. But I just need you to understand the rebellion about heavenly family, earthly family, and they work together and God's heart is broken. And he, uh, my brain is shorting out now. Okay. Now, some of the heavenly rebellious family not only rebels against God, they try to duplicate what he does. And they come down to earth and they try to imitate, have people in their image, in resistance towards God. So now it's not only just a son that's rebellious at the cooking table, it's a son trying to defeat his father's empire. It's rebellion, it's evil, it's dark, it's difficult, it's, it's heartbreaking. And yet, when you read the Bible, you see God showing up over and over and over again. And he's, he, he makes, there's so many covenants in the Old Testament, you can't believe it. There's a special discipline when you go to university just to study all the covenants and the depth thereof. It's God showing his loyalty towards, towards us over and over and over again. But we rebel over and over, okay, you get the point, okay? Now, this is the part where a book, a book like Enoch, for example, writes about this, where the, where the sons of God comes down, God's family, some of them, and they rebel on earth and they break the barriers. Now, I don't have time to go into this, but there's so many references, even in the New Testament, to this idea. And I know you guys are like, what is this guy saying? It's just too much. I, 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 again, I want to assure you, I'm not making conspiracy theories. I'm telling you what stands in the Bible. Just read it, I promise, okay? And now look at this. And in um, what does God want? He says, the story is about how some of God's supernatural children, the sons of God, wanted to imitate God by producing their own human children to image themselves. Now, you might not want to believe this, but this is the story of the Bible. Not just the rebellion in the Garden of Eden, but we've got this idea very close to the flood where there was a second rebellion of God's sons, his family in heaven, and then he, they, they come down and they corrupt us and we willfully follow. And it just becomes this whole mess. This entire, entire mess of a situation. It gets worse, okay? There's rebellion number three, okay? And this is the, the division of the land. I quickly spoke about this in a previous occasion. I didn't expand on this. And this is the Tower of Babel where men get together and they want to lift themselves up. And God comes to a point where he says, I did everything for mankind. There's, I love you guys. I want you. I want a family. But you guys are rebelling and rebelling and rebelling. And God comes to this point where the terminology is, he divorces the nations. He pulls away from mankind. He, he steps away and says, okay, you don't want me to do? Okay, the family in heaven, you manage. And the family on earth, you manage. And you guys do what you feel you need to do. And I'm stepping away because there's no reciprocity. There's no return. And the Bible, the Old Testament, yeah, it gets, it gets worse. goes so far to say that God comes to a point. I espite that I demands to make it. He comes to a point where, listen to this terminology, he regrets creating a family. Can you imagine that your household is so in a bad condition, 
that it comes to the point where you regret regret something that is supposed to be the biggest blessing and it's not even god's fault now at this point and again there's so many scripture verses but then we're never going to go home today if i had to explain every point but up until this point in the story god was dealing with humanity as a collective whole and that changed at babel human beings would be segregated by language and geography okay okay you can go to the next one for me please even worse god divorced himself from humanity fed up with human defiance of his will god assigned the nations of the earth to other members of his supernatural family the sons of of god now i know for some people you go to church you only talk about communion you always talk about baptism you only talk about paying tithing and having bazaars this is going to be the strangest stuff but i want you to understand that the narrative of the old testament writes the heartbreak of god over and over and over again that is what these stories it's not just strange stories to tell because people were bored it's explaining to you god's desire for us his longing for us and our rebellious nature over and over and over again now i i, I don't have time to touch on abraham and the nation of israel and how that was restored in the new testament we will get to that next year when we touch on the new testament um, um books but i want you to hold on to this now let's rewind zechariah the restoration of the nation of israel they are returning to jerusalem and he sees this vision of joshua and he says you know what i'm going to put you on clean clothes first a lot of bad stuff has happened there's a lot of rebellion there's a lot of chaos in the world so much that i regret but i will come once more to a point where i say i will put new clothes on you but but i need you to follow my ways not in a sense of rules and you will get a hiding in the sense of this relationship there's there's a response from mankind in other words it's a conversation of us not just using god again a conversation of just music, misusing him once more. It's a conversation to say, God, God's love is unconditional. But if we want a relationship, we need to respond towards those love. And God says, this is how you respond. You treat people better. That's the best part of it all. The rules are the way we treat one another. The rules are focused on community. The rules are not as much focused as uh, Netflix no, 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 no. Most of God's rules and assignment is compared to how we re treat each other. You know why? Because the rebellions that took place always caused relational destruction. Think about any rule in the Bible. It focuses on relational destruction over and over. That's the best part of it all. God's expectance on us is not even selfish for him. He says now that if you want to show me that you love me, treat the, pe the person next to you better. Serve a little, forgive a little bit, be a little bit more merciful, be a little bit more gracious. But this is what we do. We take God's grace in the clean clothes and we use it for our own profit. And now it becomes a little bit dirty. And God says, no, 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 that's not going to work. I've been through this multiple times, you know. I was there in the Garden of Eden. I was there when my kids rebelled and it came down to you guys. I was there at the Tower of Babel where, where God stepped away. I was there. I was ready. I was committed to you. But you did not care for me. And you know how God comes to the point where we don't care? Because we murder each other. We steal from one another. We rebuke one another. There's, there's tension amongst each other. And God looks and says, this is not the world that I created. And now we look at the world and say, oh, there's no good God. Because look at this world. It was us. God is the only good thing left in this world. The, the, the values of a father that says, you know, now, you, now, now we have the audacity to blame him for hate and murder and wars. Ladies and gentlemen, all those things, the essence are found in our lack of responding to his rules and regulations. And now we have the audacity to say they, they can't be any God. There's no way. All these bad things happen in us. Where is God? Well, he tried a couple of times. He tried many times. He even sent his own son in a final move to restore and reverse things. After he stepped away from the nations, he sent his son to say, now the good news is here. The good news is the door is open once more. You can return again. God is saying he's giving us this opportunity to build a relationship. And the essence is how we treat each other. 
and don't miss, I'm not talking about good works in the sense, okay? I'm talking about the essence is a relational element, okay? So faithfulness and righteousness. I hope you guys can remember because uh, I know I'm sharing so many information. So we have the story in Zechariah that says, if we follow the laws, if we respond to our relationship to God, if the faith on the inside can be seen in fruit on the outside, then God's heart will be connected to us. He still loves us. It's not working for his love. It's responding to his love. And this is what people miss, especially people inside the church. Even when we know this, we try to work for God's approval. We try to serve for God's approval. We try to do good works and we, we argue on the inside because I'm not less for this, but I'm going to do it because I want the new order next week or whatever the case may be. You, you are missing this. You are, you, you, you're missing the essence of relational. You're missing the essence of, man, because God loved me first, I want to love him back. The best way we love him is how we take care of each other. It's our humanity. It's our compassion. It's words like family, community, love, mercy, faithfulness, grace, forgiving. There's all these beautiful things built into the setup. I want to conclude. I hope this three rebellion conversation didn't put you off of the Bible on any case. Um, there's really just not enough in time to go into that. But I want to just express this to you. Um, obviously, I can't speak to everyone all the time. But if you guys want to pop us an email, if you guys would like to come and see me, I would take the time to go through each one of these points. I can show this to you in the Bible. I can show you the references. There's no problem. I would actually love to do that for you. The last thing that I want you to walk out is saying, oh, we teach strange things. No, no. We just read the Bible passages that you don't hear about in the other churches, okay? And oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I just want to refer. I, I don't mean to bash other churches. This is not the intention of my heart. I'm just trying to explain because of the oddness of these scripture verses, people tend to just skip over this because it's very strange, you know? And it's not my intention to skip over. I want you to understand because this explains the depth of God's love for us. That we, we fail him over and over and over again. Yet you still have another opportunity to be here. I messed up in the week and, and God just expects me just to express that confession. In other words, Lord, I messed up. And God says, well, let's give it another go. Why? Because there's relationship. But if you show up for unconditional love only, you're going to come to a point in your life where you are going to say, God does not exist because I gave a 10 rand to the church and he never gave me a 100 rand back. You're going to come to a point in your life where you say, I prayed, I never got the promotion because you are consuming from God and you are not contributing to God. Relationship. It's conditional reciprocity. It's conditional. God makes a covenant, but a covenant goes both ways. There's two sides of the story where God gives his commitment from his side, but there's his expectation of a response. I want to just ask you one simple question and I'm done. Have you responded to God? Or have you just been consuming to, from God? Have you responded to God? Or have you been just consuming from God? And we can preach and we can shout and we can do a lot of things, but this is a personal decision that you need to make. Say, Lord, I'm going to pursue you. I'm going to build a relationship with you. I'm not here just to get a blessing and run out the front door. I'm sorry for messing up. I'm, I'm out of the story about the rebellions and how things are messing up. All that God wants is his family to sit around the table, share a meal. Sometimes the only thing that I want in my family is just for one day where we gather together. Kids aren't complaining about fighting about whose tennis ball is where. Kids aren't fighting about whose shoe is whose shoe. I don't know who used the floors last. We just want peace where we gather together, we have a meal, and we laugh at a couple of jokes about bad service at a restaurant. But I will tell to you guys about that at another stage. The waffle was so dry, I was convinced they just took a cut out off the board and just put it down on the table. But I'm going to talk about that at another time. But I hope, I hope you're getting the heart of this. I hope you're getting the heart of this. Treat people better. Just start there. Treat people better. Have compassion. Have a little bit of love. 
have a little bit of grace. If you can just get there, you are taking a step closer in responding towards God. Because you have received grace, now you need to be grace. You have received forgiveness, and now you need to be forgiveness. I hope this is putting Zechariah a little bit in a, in a context for you guys. And I hope this has been a blessing to you. Oh, oh this is not confusing. But you guys are smart enough. I know this. You guys are smart enough because you know what the right thing is on the inside of them. Maybe the information was a little bit strange, but you know the values, the relationship, the family that I'm talking about, that's the essence. That's why you are here because this is what you know about God. And I hope that has been making a little bit of sense to you. Let's pray together. Father, so our hearts are surrendered unto you and we just want to say thank you for your word. Always powerful, always depth, always so rich, Father. And sometimes there's so many strange things in the word that sometimes we, we don't understand it always so well, Father. But we know one thing. We want to stand in a real relationship with you. And, and sometimes we mess things up and sometimes we are rebellious on the inside of our hearts. But Father, we want to do what we can. We want to just return because it's not just about consuming your unconditional love. We want to contribute to this relationship. We want to be part of a healthy family. We want to be the difference that this world needs, Father. So my prayer and desire is that your spirit would just open up this word, that your spirit would expand on these ideas in our inside of our hearts, Father, and above and beyond else. My desire this morning is that each one would respond to the call of standing in relationship with you, Father. So as we are praying, we just want to give anyone an opportunity. They just want to open their heart before God and just surrender unto Him. Father, you know everyone's heart. May your Spirit just be with them in this process. Thank you for being good to us. We pray that in Jesus' wonderful name and together we say, Amen and Amen. Just the announcements. Thank you.